Matthew chapter 22 tonight as we continue on. And uh, just a great chapter, a lot in here, a lot more parables. And we're kind of continuing on in the same theme from Matthew 21, which teaches and validates here in the first ten verses this, uh, this doctrine of what's commonly called replacement theology. And that's the doctrine that uh, the Gentiles, those that have put their faith in Christ, have replaced uh, the nation of Israel as God's chosen people. Now, in the Old Testament times, uh, you know, the, the nation of Israel were those that were uh, chosen of God. They were God's anointed people. They were God's uh, peculiar people. But uh, today, we believe in a doctrine that uh, some people would ridicule and mock and say is erroneous and say is unbiblical. And that is the doctrine of replacement theology, that we as New Testament believers have replaced the nation of Israel which is uh, actually quite biblical, and, and, and it's something that Jesus taught, and it's something that we see him refer to many times in, the par in these parables. And Matthew chapter 22 is no exception. That, in fact, that's what we see here in these verse, 10, 10 verses. Uh, the fact that the Jews had rejected Christ, and then because of that, God replaced them, which really just makes sense, doesn't it? That if somebody's going to reject somebody, you know, they're not just going to hang around and linger like some kind of a psycho or a stalker, right? I mean, you think of some guy... Maybe he's trying to get a date with a girl, or he has an interest in a girl, and you know, and she keeps rejecting him. Only a weirdo would hang around and, and try to be, you know, in, insisting on that relationship. Well, in the same way, it's kind of weird to think that that God, you know, it's not so strange to think that if, if someone rejected God, that God would just move on, that God would just go and find the people that would accept him, and that's exactly what God has done today. You know, maybe that's kind of a baser illustration to use uh, to illustrate this point. But it, it, it just makes sense that if someone rejects God, but why wouldn't he just move on? Why wouldn't he just go find somebody that would accept him? Why is it really so strange to think that God will reject a nation that has rejected him? And it's something that's just taught you know, time and time again in the Bible. And it says here in verse 1, And Jesus answered and spake unto them uh, again by parables. Now remember who it is that he's talking to. And it says there, He spake unto them. He's speaking unto the Pharisees. He's speaking unto the Sadducees. He's speaking unto the Jews. He's talking unto this nation. And he said, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a certain king which had made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bid to the wedding, and they would, uh, and they would not come. So, of course, there that them that were bidden, those were the nation of Israel. That's who God is trying to uh, you know, bring into the kingdom of heaven. That is the illustration that's being given here. This marriage supper is likened unto heaven. It's like, likened unto going into heaven. Uh, and it, it's saying here that God was, you know, He was asking them to come. They were bidden. He, they were invited. They were welcomed. But it was them that refused to come. They were the ones that refused the, the invitation, that rejected the uh, invitation to come. So really, the Jews don't have any excuse today. They had no excuse then. Uh, they weren't ignorant. It wasn't something that they weren't aware of. You know, God, in fact, was very long-suffering to them. Uh, if you would, keep something there in Matthew 22, but just turn over to Matthew chapter 23. I mean, people say, well, that's kind of callous. It seems kind of hard that God would just turn out, you know, reject this nation for rejecting Him. I mean, why is God, you know, why, why doesn't He just, you know, make an exception here? But here's the thing. The Bible says, unto whom much is given shall also much, much more be, uh, also be required. You know, uh, if you know much, if you've been taught many things out of the Word of God, God is going to hold you more accountable. And the Jews, I mean, they knew the God of the Bible. God was their God, you know, when they were right with Him, and they worshipped Him. They had the, the Old Testament, they had the prophets, they, they should have known and understood these things. And it's not that God wasn't long-suffering towards them. God was very long-suffering to the people of Israel. And there in Matthew 23, look at verse 37, we even see the heart that Jesus had. I mean, a lot of times you read in the New Testament where Jesus really cracks down on the Jews. Really, really comes down hard on him and calls him out and preaches hard sermons against them, which is right to do. But let's not forget the heart that he had for them, that there was a real burden that God had in his heart for these people. It says there, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Now before I even start reading this, let's look at the very end. There's an exclamation point there. This isn't just something that Jesus said passively. You know, he's exclaimed, this is an exclamation. This is something he said very loudly, very emphatically, something that he was very passionate about. When he said, O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often I have, would, have gath, would I have gathered thy ch children together, even as a hen gathereth her chicks under her wings, and ye would not. So it's not God's fault that the Jews were rejected. It's not God's fault that they refused uh, to be 
a part of um, the, the, uh, that new Jerusalem, that new uh, people of God. That it's not God's fault that, you know, quite frankly, they were replaced. Uh, it's their fault. They're the ones that would not. They're the ones that were, uh, would not come to the wedding. And remember, he's, I mean, Jesus in the sermon, he just got, you know, Matthew chapter 21, he just got done shredding these guys. Right. And he's just driving the same point home in this chapter. And he just keeps getting on about it. And he's trying to, you know, make them see the error of their ways. Go ahead and turn over to Romans chapter 10. And when you get to Romans 10 tonight, just go ahead and bookmark it. Put something there. We're going to come back to it later. Of course, we're going to be back in Matthew 22, so keep something there as well. We're going to go to Matthew 10, and we're going to come back a little bit later. But, you know, God, uh, the Jews have no excuse. God was very long-suffering to them. And we saw, we read there where Jesus, you know, had this heart for them that he said he would gather them together as, as a hen would her, her chicks. In Romans 10, 18, it says, But I say unto you, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel though? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation will I anger you. But Isaiah says very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not, I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel he saith, all day long have I, I have stretched out forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. He's saying all day, God has been very long suffering with the nation of Israel to this point. He is, he is pleading with them. He has sent the prophets unto them. He sent even His own Son to preach to them. And remember what Jesus told His disciples. He said, go not and, you know, to the Samaritans, but go only to the lost house of the tribes of, of, of Israel. Yeah, that, was, that was His primary focus when He first started His ministry, was to go and reach the, the lost house uh, of tr uh, tribes of the house of Israel. And after that, of course, He then went unto the Gentiles, and He went to the Samaritans, and He even told His apostles to go into all, all corners of, you know, go into uh, into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But it's not that God, you know, just uh, all of a sudden decided to do away with Israel. This was something that took time. This is something that he pleaded with them over. They had multiple, multiple people come to them. They are without excuse for having rejected Christ. God's long suffering is even evident in this parable itself, in that the same group is bitten twice. I don't know if you noticed that there. It says there in verse 4, after they. Of course, in verse 3, it says that they would not come. Then in verse 4, it says, Again, he sent forth other servants, and saying, Tell them which are bid, and behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed. All things are ready. Come unto the marriage. So he doesn't just go to them once and then give up on them. He sends even more messengers unto them and has the same message and pleads with them to come. So the Jews really today, they are without excuse for having rejected them. See, the rejection and the replacement of the Jews today is of their own doing. You know, they, they are the ones that refuse Christ. And, uh, you know, that's why we don't need to, uh, you know, feel all sorry for uh, for what's what's gone on. I mean, it's, it's, of course, humanly speaking, the suffering and things that they've endured are, 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 are unfortunate. But let's remember that they brought, they said, let his blood be on us and on our children. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that, that was something they brought upon their own heads. Um, Anyway, it says there in verse 5, But they made light of it, and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his mar merchandise. So we see that some people in this parable, they were just indifferent. You know, but in God's eyes, you might as well be, you know, it's no different than being spiteful as these other ones. Verse 6, And, and the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. You know, the, the only, only some of them slew them. You know, the remnant did. The other ones were just indifferent. You know, they were just, yeah, I'm just going to go to my merchandise. I'm just going to go to my farm. I'm just going to go my own way. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do this guy any harm, but I'm just not interested. No thanks. But, in God, but they both got rejected. But they both, neither, neither of them made it into the wedding. So it goes to show us here that, you know, just being apathetic or being indifferent does not, is not an excuse. You know, that, that it's the saying that goes that silence is agreement. You know, if we see something going on that's wrong, we should speak up. You know, we should, if someone comes to us and starts, you know, saying things that they shouldn't, we should just shut them down. And that's hard to do. Sometimes that's hard to do when people uh, say things, you know, that, that they shouldn't be saying to you. You know, it's kind of hard to have that boldness sometimes to say, hey, you know what, you should talk like that. You know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't talk like, you shouldn't think like that and rebuke somebody. But, uh, you know, here, this, this parable is an example of the fact that, you know, just going your own way is no different than even, in some instances, being spiteful. 
And it says there in the verse 6, And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. Verse 7, But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers. Now he calls them murderers. I mean, that's, that's what they were. And he burned up their city. So the people that were just doing their own thing and just were disinterested, they, they suffered the same consequences. So, you know, just being apathetic, that's not an excuse to just be, well, I'm just indifferent to this. You know, that's, that's not going to pass. That's not going to fly. Then saith he to his servants, the wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. <clears throat> so we have to remember in all of this that it was the Jews themselves that brought about this rejection. It was them who refused the first group of servants when they were bidden, said, no, not interested. It was them who refused the second group of servants that were sent. And they went so far as to even, uh, some of them taking them and spitefully entreating them. And uh, this was all, this is, they're all their own doing. They're the ones that brought it about. Now, if you would, uh, go over to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. He says there in the end of verse 8, he says, They that were bidden were not worthy. Right? In Acts 13, verse 14, it, or 44, it says there, actually just down to verse 46, Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should have first, first have been spoken to you. And he's speaking to the Jews. But seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. So this was of their own doing. They judged, they deemed themselves unworthy. And it was preached to them first. You know, the, the, the servants were sent to them. The servants were sent to them multiple times and bid them first before it ever went to the Gentiles. Now, of course, the Gentiles were always welcome. It's just that they didn't get that, you know, that, that bright, you know, that, that golden invitation. You know, they didn't get the golden ticket, so to speak. It wasn't just in their face like it was with God. They were, you know, the oracles of God had not been committed unto them. And that was the purpose of Israel in the Old Testament. They were to be a light unto the Gentiles. The Gentiles were supposed to look to Israel and say, this is the, you know, the, the God that they served was the true and living God. And then they would be converted and, 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 and accept their God as well. But we see here again, the theme of this parable is that the Jews have rejected Christ and therefore God has rejected them. Yeah. And that it's of their own doing. You know, they're the ones that have chosen to do this. So what, is, what, you know, what does God do? Does He just you know, you know, throw the food out? You know, wrap up the feast. Yeah, I guess we're not going to do anything. Just close heaven's gates. Well, if the Jews can't make it, nobody can. Is that is that how, his attitude? No. Look at verse 9 there, back in Matthew chapter 22. He says, Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. Now, I love this part of the parable. Um, of course, we know that the marriage feast represents the second coming of Christ and His kingdom. It represents, you know, Him coming and, and, and setting up His kingdom. We find that in Revelation chapter 19. You know, for sake of time, I'm not going to turn there. But it's, I'll just I'll read to you very quickly. It says in verse seven, "Let us be glad, therefore, and rejoice, and give honor to Him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and he hath made his, and hath made her wife ready. And to her was give granted that she be arrayed in fine linen." And his wife hath made herself ready, and to her was granted that she be arrayed and finally, excuse me, clean and white. For the linen, fine linen, is the righteousness of the saints. So we see that in, in uh, Revelation 19, when Christ sets up his kingdom, you know, he's saying there that uh, they see the bride, the, the, the marriage feast of the, of the Lamb, and that the, his bride is arrayed in fine linen, right? And it kind of ties in here uh, with this one as well, with this parable that we're reading, because we're going to read about the fact that there were some that did not, there was one that did not have a wedding garment. So you can see how that linen, that, that wedding garment was to be worn. That was something to show that you were a part of this, this group that had been invited. So the fine linen, of course, is the righteousness of the saints. That's what it's referring to there in Revelation 19. That is the righteousness of those that are saved. Uh, you know, and our, righteous, our righteousness is not our own righteousness. And that's what we really need to understand here is that, you know, the fine linen these people are wearing is representative of, of their righteousness, but it's not their righteousness. Amen. And if you would turn over to Philippians chapter, actually, you know what, go over to uh, Romans 10 if you're still there. Romans 10. So the Bible says in Philippians 3, and be found, uh, Paul said he wanted to be found in him, Christ, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, 
but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Amen. So that's the righteousness, that's the fine linen that we need to wear if we're going to be a part of that marriage feast of the Lamb. Is that we need to be wearing the righteousness of Christ in our life. Not our own righteousness. Not our own good works. Not the things that we have done. As it says in you know, uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, not by works, or, uh, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's not of our own selves. It's not of works. It's not of the things that we do that are going to earn our way into heaven. Amen. Because it is the gift of God. You don't work for a gift, right? So the linen that we need to wear to be part of this marriage supper of the Lamb is the righteousness of Christ. Look there in Romans chapter 10. And that was something that the Jews didn't want to wear. Right? That's what they didn't want. They wanted the righteousness which came of the law. Look at verse 1, Romans 10. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness uh, and going about to establish their own righteousness had, and have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. So when you're trying to establish your own righteousness, you're not submitting yourself to the righteousness of God. You're saying, I'm good enough. I'm doing it. You know, lest any man should boast. That's exactly what you're doing when you're establishing your own righteousness. You're boasting. And the Bible says that no flesh should glory in His presence. Look at verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believe it. Amen. Not everyone that worketh, not everyone that's a good person. Right? It's everyone that believe it. Yeah. And this is just something that comes up in, over and over and over again in the, in the Gospels. Galatians 2 says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. If righteousness come by the law, you know, keeping the commandments, then Christ is dead in vain. Look, if you can work your way into heaven, why did Jesus have to die? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why didn't he have to go through all that suffering and the agony and, and, and living that hard? You know, it's not easy to live a sinless life. I mean, I know he was God and he was capable of doing it, but that doesn't mean it was easy. And he goes through all that. And then he dies that painful death, and you're going to tell me that you're going to work your way into heaven? Then he's dead in vain. Then why did he even have to do that? Because we can't work our way into heaven, because all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, the Bible says. The Bible says in Galatians 3, even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, it wasn't his works that got him into heaven, it was his faith. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1, but of, ye are him, are, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Mm -hmm. Christ is made unto us righteousness. That's the righteousness that we have to wear. Our faith in Christ. That's going to, that is the wedding garment that we are to wear. And see, that's why in this parable, both bad and good are bidden. And I love the fact that he gives them that order. That he says both bad and good. Not good and bad. He puts the emphasis, you know, the bad of the first ones mentioned. Maybe they were the first ones in. The ones who realize, hey, there's nothing good about me. You know, maybe it's the people that aren't living a good life, that are, their life is a mess. You know, they, they're, they're, they're just making a mess out of things. They're usually the ones that are easier to get saved. You know, when you walk up to them and say, hey, all of sin, are you a sinner? I mean, they know it. How long do you have to really, you know, sit there and explain to somebody that they're a sinner? Well, everybody gets that. I think in all the years I've gone so long, I can think of only one person that has told me they're not a sinner. And she was crazy. <laughs> I mean, she was really, I mean, really, she was crazy. Like, she was a, she was a nut. So, I, I mean, her pot was cracked. And we just left. <laughs> and that, that was it. I mean, you'd be crazy to sit there and say that you're not a sinner. And that's what bad people, people who are living sinful lives, understand better than anybody. You know, even the good person will say, well, I'm a, yeah, I'm a sinner, but I'm not a bad person. You know, I'm still, I'm still a good guy. I still do a lot of good things. And what they're counting on is the fact that they're going to do more good than bad. You know, that's how they're going to get to heaven, through their own works, their own righteousness. But I love there that he goes and he bids the bad and the good. And it just goes to show us again, as the Bible reiterates over and over again, that faith is not of works. It's not of works. It, you know, going, that salvation is not of works. If faith, it's by faith, not of works. Amen. So look at verse 11. It says, And when the king came to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. You know, he didn't have the righteousness of Christ on and that was the distinguishing thing. That's what set people apart in here. Everybody else has got the garment on, not this guy. I mean, that would feel pretty weird. I remember one time I went to a wedding, and I was like, you know what? I've been to a few weddings now, and I dressed a little too casual. I was wearing jeans. You know, I, I didn't go so far as a t-shirt. But uh, every, I show up, and, and there wasn't like tuck, you know, it wasn't like everyone's in a tux or anything like 
like that. But everyone you know, normally wears a button up, maybe some nicer pants. Just to kind of show some respect. And I wasn't trying to be disrespectful, I was probably just being a little lazy. You know? <laughs> but I went there, and sure enough, somebody walked up to me and said, Fred, how come it's no other with not wearing it? Where's your wedding garment? You know? And I was just like, oh man. And I almost went home and changed. I felt that bad about it. And from that, I've never done it again. <laughs> but can you just imagine this guy like being there without a wedding garment on? And like going go to a party where like everyone's wearing this, and you decide to, to show up and not wear it. I mean, Pastor Anderson always tells that part of that story about the chili cook-off, where he told everybody, he said, look, this is on Halloween, we do it every Halloween. This is not a Halloween party. Do not come in a costume. And nobody showed up in a costume except one lady. She came dressed as a witch. Oh. You know, can you imagine how embarrassing that would be? That would be so embarrassing. But that's this guy right here. You know, he's in heaven thinking he's going to got there by his own works, you know, and he's the only one without the garment on. You know, it's embarrassing. And it would be sad. Because look what happens to him. He had to say to him, friend, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Uh, 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 no excuse, right? Then said the king to his servants, bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. My friend, if you're thinking you're going to get into heaven by your own righteousness tonight, you don't have the wedding garment on. You're going to show up to the garment, to the, to the wedding, and you're going to be wearing something else. Amen. You know, you're going to show up the chili cook-off dressed as a witch. <laughs> and you're going to leave ashamed. You're going to be weeping. There's going to be some gnashing of teeth. Right? And that's the picture that we're getting here. That if you want into heaven, you have to be wearing the right garment. And that garment you need to wear is salvation by faith. Amen. Alone Amen. in Christ. True. Not of works. And he says there at the end, in verse 14, For many are called, but few are chosen. Now this came up a few weeks ago. And I said we kind of talk a little bit more tonight, so I'm going to try and do that with what time we have. So it says there, you know, many are called, but few are chosen. So what does that mean? Now, let me just say this. Chosen simply means saved or elect. That's what it means. It just means that it's just talking about there are many, many are called, but few people are saved. That would be another way of saying it. And, uh, you know, it's not in the sense, when people read that word chosen, they get this idea that God is somehow picking and choosing who's going to go to heaven and who isn't. You know, it's like the crane game at the, at the, at the arcade where God's going to put in a quarter and go find his favorite doll and, you know, pull it out and drop it in, right? That's not how God works. God's not just like, you're saved, you're not, you're saved, you're not. That would be very, that would not be good. <laughs> that, would, that would not be the type of God that you would want to serve. Yeah. I mean, that you, that, that's not, and that's not who God is, you know? So it's not this Calvinistic doctrine that God predestinates some people to heaven and predestinates other people to hell and you just have no say in the matter. You know, the, the choice is entirely up to you. I mean, that's what we just saw in this parable. God is sending messengers, sending messengers, bidding them to come, bidding them to come. And they're the ones that are refusing. It's not that just God is saying, well, you're invited and you're not. Uh, it, everyone is called, but few are chosen in the sense that few people are actually saved. And uh, look, I'll just read to you. Go to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Well, you're going to uh, 1 Peter 2. I'll read from Revelation 17, which says, these shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For He is the Lord of Lords, King of Kings, and they that are with Him are called chosen and faithful. So who are the chosen? Those that are with Christ. So that's what it means to be chosen. That's what it means to be uh, you know, uh, a, a chosen person. It means you are with God. You are one of God's people. It doesn't mean that God chose you. It just means that you are one of God's people. You are saved. You are one of the elect. Okay, so it says here in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 7, unto you, there, uh, unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders allow, the same has become at the corner. Look at verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation. The same people that believe, right, in verse, uh, verse 7, are those that are a chosen generation. So you see again, how to be chosen is because you have believed. Not that God randomly picked you out of a hat, decided that you are going to be saved and others weren't. It's you are chosen because you have believed. Mm -hmm. Right there? So look at it. It goes on in verse 9. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of His darkness uh, into His marvelous light. So yeah, God calls people, but it's whether or not they respond to that call that determines whether or not they are chosen. They have the, the ability and the uh, opportunity to choose whether or not they are going to be saved, whether or not they're going to believe on Christ or reject Him, whether they're going to trust in their own works or in the works of Christ and make Him their righteousness. 
The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, in fact, go over to Romans chapter 8, because this is important. We need to make sure we understand this. When people say, well, God, the Bible says that God predestinates people. That God has predestinated certain people. And it says here in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. Ah, uh -huh. see that? Right there. God predestinated him. Case closed, right? No. What did he predestinate them to? It doesn't say he chose them to be saved. He predestinated them to be conformed to the image of His Son. That's the predestination. Now, God is all-knowing. That's why it says, and for whom He did foreknow. I mean, it would be impossible for God to not know who's going to get saved. God knows all things. He's omniscient. He's om omnipowerful. He knows all things. Amen. He's omnipresent. He knows He's you know the beginning and the end. Oh. So it only stands to reason that God already knows who's going to reject uh, the free gift of salvation and who's going to accept it. God knows who those people are. That doesn't mean that he picked them. It just means he knows. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But he says, okay, those people that I know are going to accept uh, the free gift of salvation through faith in Christ, those people, he says, I'm going to predestinate them to be conformed to the image of my son. They're going to be like my son. That's the predestination. That when you get saved, God has determined that you would be conformed, made like unto the image of his son. Then that's what we see in uh, 1 John chapter 3. Turn over there, 1 John chapter 3. See, God foreknew who would receive and who would reject Christ by their own choosing. He already knows who it is that's going to choose Him and who's going to reject Him. It doesn't mean He, he decided that for Him. It just means He knows that. He predestinated the results, right? What would happen to those that choose that, that accept Him? He said, what I'm going to predestinate, what I'm going to determine is going to happen to these people that choose to believe on, on Christ is that they be conformed to the image of my son. So being conformed to the image of Christ is our destiny. right? Now a destiny is not something that you choose. It's something that's predestined. It's something that is going to happen to you inevitably. With, with no, You don't have any say in the matter. It's your destiny is to, to something that is determined. Right? So being conformed to the image of God is, or God's Son, is our destiny. That's, how, that's what we are predestinated to. Why? Because we have chosen to accept Christ, because we have put our faith in Him. <clears throat> that's what it says here in 1 John chapter 3, look at verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. Well, we're, you know, we're, we shall be this. But we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him. For we shall see Him as He is. The Bible teaches us that we are predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. And we get a glimpse a little bit of what Christ was like in that, pre, in that resurrected body. Now, when He's saying we're going to be conformed to the image of His Son, it's meaning that we're going to have a body like Christ. And there's a lot of, that goes into that. And we see a few of the things there where you know, he, uh, he, he was able to just appear with His disciples and disappear. So He got to teleport, you know. That's pretty cool, right? I'd like that. Who wouldn't want to be able to do that? And this really makes sense when you think about it when the Bible teaches us that we shall rule and reign with Christ. That some people will be appointed over ten cities and some uh, you know, other cities and some a few cities. And that we are going to literally rule and reign with Christ on this earth. We will actually be enforcing uh, Christ's kingdom. I believe is what the Bible teaches us. And really it's a whole other sermon. But So it only makes sense that in order for us, let's say you're... Let's say, okay, you know, uh, Brother Fabian here, he's made ruler over Tucson, right? Remember, God went to prepare a place for us, right? So Fabian's mansion is in the New Jerusalem, right? So that's on the other side of the world. So Fabian's ruling over, you know, and, well, I don't believe Tucson will be here because America's Babylon. But <laughs> just go with me, all right? So wherever in the world, he's in some other part. Okay, maybe he's like ruling over, I don't know, where do you want to rule? Brazil. He just looks like the guy who wants to rule down the Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, right? South America is going to make it, I think. So let's say he's got he's got Rio de Janeiro. That's his. It's a big city. He'd be a good man for the job, right? So he, but he's living in Jerusalem. So what's he supposed to do? He's got to go down there and straighten some people out, you know, in, in Christ's kingdom over in old Rio de Janeiro. Is he going to come out of Jerusalem, get on a bus, get on a plane, get on a boat, fly over there? No, it would make sense that he could have a body that would just, bam, he's there, right? So that's what we're condemned was we are predestinated to be. That's pretty deep. That's far out, man. Right? That's pretty cool, I think. 
So that's one part of it. And we also saw that Christ ate, right? That he said, you know, they brought him fish, they brought him honey, and he ate those things. So we'll have a body that can eat. Amen. He said that uh, a spirit hath not flesh and bone as you see me to have. So it would, it would appear that we're not going to have a circulatory system. That we won't have a heart, and vessels, and things like that. Because remember, the life of the flesh is in the blood, but when we have eternal life, we can no longer die. There's no need for that. Hmm. So this is just a whole other thing. It's a really interesting topic. And I don't know how I went from what I was preaching on that. Oh yeah, predestination. Right? So we're predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. We're not predestinated to be saved. Right? Many are called. You know, God God wants everyone to be saved. Amen. And that's really, uh, you know, something we have to keep in mind too. That's what's so dangerous about this doctrine, the fact that People want to teach that, you know, God picks and chooses who's going to be saved. We really don't have any part. You know, Christ, uh, the Bible says that we are ambassadors for Christ. We beseech you on Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. That we are in Christ's stead, you know, we are to reconcile the world unto Christ in His stead. That's a big responsibility. And when this Calvinist type of thinking creeps into a person's mind, where they think, well, God just picks and chooses, and if someone's... And I've heard Baptist preachers say this, oh, if they're supposed to get saved, they'll get saved. Even if I don't give them the gospel, somebody else will. Because it, it's, it's God's will. That's Calvinism, friend. That's you being influenced by some wicked doctrine that just teaches that God picks and chooses people. That means God willing, God says just sends people to hell just because He wants them to go there. Not because they rejected Him. Not because they're just because God just said they don't. They, they never had a chance. That's a wicked doctrine that uh, we should just never let it into our minds. We should fight it every turn. <coughs> Um, so let me try to find my place here where I was but so of course we're predestined to be the, the image of God we're going to have a body like him you know and, and, if, and here's the thing you know, you're, if you're still there in 1 John you know it says there in verse 3 and every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure you know you're predestined to be like unto Christ so you might as well just start the process right now you know and that's why the Bible says in Romans chapter 12 I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. I mean, is it really unreasonable for God to ask you to start living a holy life now if you were to be predestinated under the image of His Son? If God's going to give you a glorious body fashioned like unto His own sons? If you're going to have the very mind of Christ, is it too much to ask, for God to ask you to just start living like that now? Amen. To go ahead and start living a pure life now? Amen. To go ahead and, and just, you know... If you know, present your body a living sacrifice, which is your reasonable service. It's not unreasonable for God to ask that. He says, "Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may be able to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God." So, you know, you go ahead and turn back to Matthew where you were, but it says that you know many are called. Well, why does it say many are called but few are chosen? Well, many are called because God so loves the world, you know, and because He is the Savior of all men, because He will have. All men to be saved. And that his, his voice is unto the sons of men. And, you know, God is the Savior of all men, especially those that believe. So, few are chosen because few believe. Because remember, what does it mean to be chosen? It means to have put your faith in Christ, to have been saved. That's why few are chosen. Not because God's just, you know, got this clique of people that he just wants to only have a few people in heaven, the ones that he likes. It's because chosen simply means to have put your faith in Christ, to be elect, to be those that have... Are, have the righteousness of Christ upon them. So many are, many are called because God wants everyone to be saved. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. So, we'll move on here. and we'll Go back to verse 15 where it says, Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle Him in His talk. So, again, you know, God just kind of pretty much drops a hammer on Him and tells Him, this is exactly how it is with you. And instead of them getting right, they, they go back and conspire. You know, they don't learn how to take correction. They're, they're very proud. They are a stiff-necked people. They are dull of hearing, the Bible says. And we don't want to have any of those attributes in our life. We don't want to be anything like these type of people who can never receive correction from God, who can never have the Word of God preached, who can never read it for themselves and have something that they read or hear preached uh, from the Word of God. And that is uh, contrary to themselves, that is contrary to when the Bible points out something that you're doing wrong, you don't want to be like this, where you're like going to go back and conspire and try to like entangle him in his words. You want to be, you don't want to be stiff-necked. You know, you want to be one who can receive correction. 
and not like these guys. I mean, these guys were are wicked and a lot, and they were reprobates. And it says here, then they went to the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent out unto him uh, their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know thou art true, and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. So notice when they're, 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 they're out to deceive him, right? This is exactly what they're trying to do. But notice the use of flattery. Notice how they start out. They don't just start out saying, hey, you wicked heretic, you know, we're going to, you know, what do you say about this? Huh? We got you now. Right? No, they, they lead into that. What do they use to get there, though? They flatter him. They say, we know thou art true. They don't believe he's true. If they believe he was true, they believe on him. Right. Right, they're trying to entangle him in his talk. They're trying to deceive him. They're trying to catch him. And they begin by flattering him. Teach us the way of God and truth. They don't believe this. And we should always be alert to this type of manipulation. Because this is something that people who are trying to deceive you do often. They, they don't just come to you and try to you know, take advantage of you right out of the gate. What they'll do is they'll flutter you up. Right? You think about the kid who wants to get something for mom and dad. Right? They don't just come out and ask it. Say, Dad, man, you lose the weight. You know, they you know, they did the dishes, you know, they something, you know, they they try to they try to butter you up. People that want to get something out of you, a lot of times they'll they'll try to do nice things. And that's not always a bad thing, you know, that's always fine. You can come tell me a lot of weight anytime you want. <laughs> Thank you. Right? It's not true, but <laughs> you know, anyway. You lost it, but you found it again. And uh, anyway, um, but we should always be alert to this type of manipulation. People that would flatter us. The Bible warns about flattery up and down. And, and, I, and I'm already kind of losing time here, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. But make no doubt about it that flattery is a form of deception. I'll read to you from Psalm 78. It says, Nevertheless, they did flatter him with their mouth, and they lied unto him with their tongues. So people are flattering you. They're saying things that they don't really believe. They'll tell you all these nice things about you. They'll flatter you, but they don't believe it. To them, it's a lie. That's what it says. They flatter with their mouth and they lied with their tongues. It's the same thing that they're saying. They're saying, oh, we know thou art true. They're, they're lying. They don't believe that. That is what flattery is. It's a form of deception. And notice what Jesus thinks of this tactic, right? This flattery that they try to throw at him. He says, uh, it says in verse 17, Tell us therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness. You know, you think flattery isn't a big deal. Jesus says it's wicked. And why can't he mean ye hypocrites? It's hypocrisy to sit there and say something and try to give somebody the impression of, uh, that you feel a certain way when you don't. That's called hypocrisy. Saying one thing but not meaning it. Saying and not doing, right, is the very definition of hypocrisy. So flattery is a wicked sin. Now, people run to extremes with this where they're afraid to even give people compliments sometimes. You know, they'll go, they'll, well, I don't want to be accused of being flattered. It's okay to, if you genuinely want to compliment somebody, by all means. And we should learn how to receive compliments. You know, I, it's something I've had to work on. You know, I don't, I don't feel that I'm the, the, the greatest preacher in the world. You know, I'm not up here to, you know, uh, deprecate myself either and say I'm the worst. But sometimes people come to me and say, hey, nice sermon, good sermon. And I've learned to say thank you. Appreciate it. It's a good book. You know, something like that. People might compliment you on things. If they really mean it, that's not flattery. You know, if someone comes up to you and says, hey, did you get a haircut? It looks nice. You flatterer. You mean that? You hypocrite. I see your wickedness. I see what you're trying to do. You know? I mean, the first clue is probably don't have, you know, anyway, I'm, I'm going to turn this into a comedy routine. So God says that, that uh, flattery is wicked. It's something he doesn't, uh, you know, he calls it out as wickedness and hypocrisies. And, and of course, what is it they're trying to entangle him here with? It's this uh, matter of, of giving pain tribute. They say, they say, tell us therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? Now today we would call that taxes. Is it lawful to pay your taxes? I don't know. Call the IRS and ask them. Is it lawful for me to pay taxes? Yeah. In fact, it's against the law to not pay your taxes. So and he says, show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And he saith unto them, who is the image and superscription? You know, they had Caesar on there. And they say unto him, Caesar's. He saith therefore unto them, render therefore unto Caesar the things which be Caesar's, and unto the things uh, unto God, and unto God the things that are God's. So he does a, it's really kind of a non-answer, but it, at the same time it's an answer, and it's a very profound truth, and it's something that we need to learn too. Is that um, it's actually a very good philosophy, this render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and the things unto God that are God's. That's a good way to live your life. Um, 
And, you know, because a lot of people, they kind of get caught up in this thing. Well, they want to fight the man. You know, they're, they're going to they're gonna go off the grid. They're going to quit paying their taxes. They're going to they're gonna fight the powers that be. They're rebels. You know, they're, they're, they're taking a stand against... And don't get me wrong. There's a lot of wicked things. There's a lot of wicked policies. A lot of wicked uh, rules in this world. A lot of wicked uh, laws that have been enacted. That's right. And, you know, there are certain things. Obviously, if there's a law that is going to cause us to disobey the commandments of God, we ought to obey God rather than men. You know, we were out soul winning today, and, and the apartment the manager had to come and, and, and remind me that we we're not allowed to do that because somebody got a phone call. I've got two phone calls, and you can't do that. And I told her, as a matter of fact, I can't do it. I'm going to continue to doing it. So if you want to stand there and argue with me, go ahead, but you're not going to stop me. Amen. You know, and she eventually went her way. But, um, you, you know, obviously, if there's some rule that says you can't go soul winning, we're still going to go soul winning. Amen. You know, but that we're not going to get caught up in this thing of like, well, you know, our tax money goes to this and that. Well, what they do with our tax money is on them. You know, and if, here's the thing. We, we're, we don't do a lot of good uh, to God sitting in a federal prison for, for tax evasion. Mm. You know, I mean, what, is that you think what that's God? That's the hill that God wants you to die on, tax evasion? Well, I didn't win any souls, Lord. You know, I, I know I could have done a lot of other things for you, but I just really, I just really had to let him know that I didn't appreciate being taxed. And I took that stand. There's no God. Render unto Caesar the things that are His, and worry about rendering unto God the things which are God's. Mm -hmm. Don't get caught up in fighting the man. You know, the Bible says in Ephesians two that, or Ephesians six that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's the battle that we're called to fight. Not a physical battle. Not a battle in politics. We're here to, to fight a spiritual fight which is a fight for the souls of men. That's the battle that we're fighting. You see, we have a greater calling than, than tax reform in this life as Christians. You know, we have a greater calling than ending the Fed. And again, I'm all for ending the Fed. It's just not, I'm not going to make that my life's calling, to go out there and end the Fed. You know, I'm going to let other people fight that battle. I have more, I'm going to let other people who want to fight that battle fight it. I have a, more, a much higher calling in life than, than fighting the man. You know, it's fighting for Christ, fighting for men, for the souls of men. That's what we're called to do. Yep. And there's just a lot, you know, and that's something I want to talk a little bit more about, but I'm kind of running out of time here. <laughs> so that's kind of just a good philosophy there to how to rule to live your life. You know, pay your taxes, let them, you know, let their blood be upon their heads, whatever they do with that money. And let's just worry about serving God and, and, and living for Him. Amen. Verse 22, it says, When they heard these words, they marveled and left Him and went their way. And the same day came unto, uh, came to him Sadducees, which say there is no resurrections, and asked him, saying, Master, Moses, uh, Moses said, If a man die having no children, uh, his, brother, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up her seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren, the first, uh, and the first, when he had married a deceased, having no issue, left his wife unto his brother, likewise the second also, and the third unto the seven. So they're using this example, because the Sadducees, they didn't believe in the resurrection. They don't believe in the spirits. They don't believe that there was a resurrection and the life. And that uh, they're saying, so they're trying to make this argument, well, you know, the Bible says that uh, that uh, when a man dies, if he hasn't had any issue, if he hasn't had any, you know, if he hasn't had any children, that his wife is to marry his brother and raise up seed unto his brethren. Well, there was this case where there was these one wife and these seven brothers, and they all died, and none of them, you know, were able to have children. It was, you know, it just went on like this. So when they're resurrected, resurrected who's, whose wife are they going to be? You know, who's, which one of the husbands is she going to be with in, in eternity? And what they're trying to prove is that the resurrection is false. Mm -hmm. That's ultimately what they're trying to get at, and they're using this roundabout way. And, uh, and this is just a good example of what people try to do to try to prove the Bible wrong. They go to these extremes, right? Mm -hmm. There were seven brethren, right? Now, could you have not made the exact same point with two brethren? You could have. You could have just, it could have been the exact same point with two or three brethren. They, there were seven of them. <laughs> and this just shows you how people think, and this is what they do, they go to these extreme examples to try to prove the Bible wrong. They always point to this extreme outlier. Well, I know the Bible says this, but did you ever think about the fact that X, Y, and Z? And it's always just like this, some far off, just like weird, strange thing. You know, and I don't want to get into specifics on some of it just because I've heard people talk about strange things that, anyway, there's, just, there's kids in the room and there's like, there's one example in particular I've heard, but I don't want to talk about it. And, uh, but my point is, is that wooden brothers have made, two brothers made the same point as seven, and then people just go to these extremes. And they have these hypotheticals. You know, they didn't say this actually happened. 
They just said, let's just suppose there was one. You know, this, there's no record of this actually having happened. Does that seem a little unlikely that a woman married seven different brothers and that they all died? And she just went from one brother to the next and none of them ever had any kids? Doesn't that seem a little extreme to you? You know, I don't think that's something that even happened. But that's what people always do they, when they're trying to prove the Bible wrong. They go to these hypotheticals, they're always extreme examples, and they're just grossly exaggerated. And, you know, the human mind just conjures up these just strange circumstances to, in effort to invalidate, you know, certain truths that they find unacceptable. And there's a whole other thing we could go into tonight about that, but we don't have time. In verse 29, it says, Jesus answered and said unto them, You do err not knowing the Scriptures. That's always the problem, is that they don't know the Bible. But the, nor the power of God for the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Sorry, Mormons. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not sorry to Mormon wives. That's probably a relief to them to realize that they're not going to have perpetually give birth to women in, or to children in heaven. That's what they teach. That's heaven for ladies in Mormonism, mm -hmm. just perpetual birth. <laughs> That's not heaven. <laughs> Well, well, they take the pain out of it or something. I'm like, well, whatever, man. That's, you guys are, give it up. <laughs> so anyway, but Jesus says they are neither married nor given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. You know, that they're not going to, that union ends. You know, that's why the vows of marriage are till death do us part, right? Because in heaven, um, you know, we're not going to be identified as husband and wife. <clears throat> he said, uh, but as touching the resurrection of the dead, verse 31, have you not, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. And the multitude who heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. And then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Again, calling him Master. You know, it says right there that they were tempting him. So they flatter him again. Master. You know, then again, you can see how, how flattery is a part of deception. Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So that's an interesting saying that Jesus said that the entire, all the law and all the prophets hangs on those two commandments. You need to love the Lord thy God with all thy strength, and all thy heart, and all thy mind, and love thy neighbor as thyself. And that really makes a lot of sense. And I... If you would go to Romans 13, we'll close there because Romans 13 is interesting because it kind of it's kind of like a parallel explanation of everything that's happening in this chapter. It covers the exact same subjects of rendering unto Caesar and the greatest commandment. It's really it's, it's, it's an interesting. It deals with tribute. It deals with the greatest of commandments. We see that in Romans 13. For, for Romans 13 verse 1, it says this: Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever there resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive unto themselves damnation. Now it's not talking about spiritual damnation. It's saying that if you go out and break the government's, uh, the, the government's rules, you're going, to be, you're going to suffer punishment. You're going to be condemned. Right? That would be another way of saying damned. Right? Being found guilty. Verse 5. Wherefore ye must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For this cause paid ye tribute also. So you can see the things that Jesus taught are carried over into, Rome, into, the, New Testament, into the, the epistles. And Paul's teaching the same thing. You know, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Render therefore also, of, uh, uh, for this cause pay ye tribute, for they are God's ministers. Verse 7, render therefore to all their dues. Now go ahead and pay your taxes. And move on and live for God. And worry, worry about serving God more than them. Tribute to whom tribute do. Custom to whom custom. Fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor, owe no man anything but to love one another. So now he's moving into this part about the commandments. See so yeah, how that's kind of an interesting passage that kind of deals with both of these subjects? He deals with tribute, and then he's talking about loving your neighbor. O man know anything, oh, oh no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another fulfilleth the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Why? Why is, it, why is all of that summed up in that one phrase, thou shalt love thy neighbor? Because of verse 10. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. You know, if you love somebody, you're not going to steal from them. You're not going to commit adultery with them. You're not going to, uh, you're not going to kill them, right? 
you're not going to bear false witness against them. If you love your neighbor, you're going to automatically keep these commandments. Because love worketh no ill to his neighbor. So you can see how the law and the prophets all hang upon that verse. That one commandment. Or those two commandments. Love thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy mind. And love thy neighbor as thyself, which Jesus said was a close second. So love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So, and you know what's kind of interesting when I saw that these two, this passage in, uh, in Romans 13 and, and in this passage in Matthew 22 tonight are kind of dealing with the exact same subjects in the exact same um, order is that it kind of leads us to this conclusion that if loving your, loving your neighbor leads to a limited government, right? That's what everybody wants. Or at least they, well, not everybody. I should take that back. Anyone who's got a brain in their head would know that you should want a limited government. A government that's going to intrude into your life, tell you what you can and can't eat, where you can and can't go, what you can and can't read, you know, or say, all these things, where you can, you know, travel bans, you know, as an example. But um, it leads to a, lover, a limited government. Because if we're all loving our neighbor, you know, if I'm not stealing from you and killing you and committing adultery, then you don't have to ask the government to come in and take care of business and deal with me. Right? And that would lead to a, a limited government. They, they, they wouldn't have to sit there and, and go around and making sure everybody's following the rules. So it's really God's system, God's commandments are perfect. The, the, word, the, the, the law of the Lord is perfect. You know, it really is. And what's great is that one day we're going to see that in action. Where when God sets up his kingdom, these are the rules. I mean, God's government is a very limited government. And the rules are pretty short. But they're pretty, they're pretty efficient, too. Because if we really love people, you know, as some libertarians would say, don't, don't break my bones and don't, and don't reach in my pocket, and we'll get along fine. You know, don't harm me and don't take what isn't yours. And, and you know, I'm not going to, and I'll do the same. We're all going to get along. And we don't need to have, you know, the, the nanny state watching over us and making sure everybody's playing nice. So... You know, loving your neighbor is a very important thing that, that we all need to do. It and really, it's it's part of God's law. It, it, it's it's really a profound thing when you think about um, how efficient God's rules are. Mm -hmm. Look at verse forty-one in Matthew uh, uh, twenty uh, twenty-two. We'll wrap it up here. It says, "While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he?'" And he's kind of tra this is like he's transitioning a whole other topic. And he's dealing with them in a whole other thing that we don't have a lot. Of, we, in fact, we have no time to dive into tonight. But he says, "They say unto them, the son of David." He say to them, "How then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, and said on my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool." If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? So. The, the, to understand this is what's Jesus asking? How is he his son if he calls him his Lord? So he's saying, why is it that David could call um, what think you of Christ who is son is he? They say the son of David. They're saying, well, the Christ is the son of David. And he's saying, well, how is it then that David called him Lord? Well, he was able to call it the because he's a son, right? How can you call your Lord son? You know, Corbin John Russell III back in my house, my little boy. You're never going to catch me calling him Lord. I'm not going to call him Sir, you know, Mister, you know, would you mind getting the body? You know, <laughs> would you like something to eat, sir? That's never going to come out of my mouth, right? That's kind of what he's saying here. He's saying, how, if he's David's son, how does he call him Lord? And it's kind of, and, and I think he just asked them this just to kind of confuse them, you know, because they couldn't understand it. But the answer is kind of simple, really. It's just because, you know. He is the great I am. Jesus is from everlasting. Mm -hmm. Yes, he's and he never he never denied being the son of David. How many times do we read already in the book of Matthew? Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Over and over again they call him the son of David. That was the title that he accepted, and it was appropriate, because he was from the lineage of David. But how is he then calling him Lord if he's his son? What he's trying to get them to admit is that he's God, which is something they didn't want to admit. He's Lord. He is. He's able to call him Lord because he is the Lord God, omnipotent, omnipresent, who is and ever shall be. He's from the ancient of days. He's everlasting. He's the beginning and the end. So that's kind of a deep subject there to end on. But that's where we're going to end it tonight. Uh, great chapter. A lot of things we can learn from it. Real again, a, another chapter in the Word of God that shows us these great profound truths that we saw there at the end. But also things that are very practical. You know, love your neighbor. You know, let's all treat one another and let's not get caught up on trying to. 
you know, fight the man or, or join some, you know, rebel resistance here on earth. Let's let's fight the good fight of faith and lead souls to Christ. Let's go ahead and pray.